See, now I have the desk, I feel like a proper newsreader, like I should be like... Hello everyone, and welcome to another Night Sky News, this time for January 2019. I'm, I'm Dr. Becky, and I'll be going through everything that you can see in the night sky this month, and then everything that's been happening in space news for the past month as well. So let's start by looking up at the night sky. So I reckon this month what I'm going to be looking for most in the sky is planets. So Mars is in the southwest sky at the minute in the evening, so long evenings, really easy to try and find it and spot it. Also Jupiter and Venus are still visible in the very early morning sky just before dawn, sort of towards the sunrise in the southeast if you're in the northern hemisphere, in the northeast if you're in the southern hemisphere. And also as we get later on into February, Saturn is going to be joining Jupiter and Venus in the early morning sky as well. And so for Northern Hemisphere latitude, there, it's going to be easier to spot Saturn the later you are in February. It's going to be rising higher and higher uh, earlier in the morning. So as I'm filming this, it's a day before the super blood moon. So the super moon that also happens to be a lunar eclipse as well, where the moon turns orange from passing into Earth's sort of shadow and sort of sunset shadow as you get refraction through the Earth's atmosphere. Unfortunately, if you miss that, there is another super moon coming up in February, so that's the 19th of February, but it won't be a lunar eclipse as well, so it won't turn orange. But it's a really nice time to sort of go out, see if you can see the moon and see if it sort of looks bigger and, and brighter than normal. So this month is all about conjunctions. And a conjunction is when two objects in the sky end up at the same sort of sky latitude. So we break the sky up into coordinates, we call these right ascension and then declination. And at the same time with things like solar system objects, because they all orbit on the same sort of plane in the solar system, they can also reach what's called an appulse, which is the sort of minimum separation that those two objects have during a conjunction as well. So there's a lot of these coming up in the next month, and it means that it actually is going to be really easy to spot some planets because they're going to come very close to the moon. So the first one is on Saturday the 2nd of February, and that's going to be a conjunction between the moon and Saturn. So the moon is going to be a really thin crescent, and Saturn is going to pass about 37 arc minutes to the north of the moon. So about the sort of diameter of the moon, again, Saturn will pass northward. So the further south you are for this one, the better. I mean, I'm talking like Sydney, you're going to have a great view. You know, if you're in the Caribbean, probably as well. Florida, it's going to be a little bit low on the horizon. So like the further south you are, the better. So the next one is on Sunday the 10th of February. This is between the moon and Mars in the evening in the southwest. Uh, the moon is probably going to pass about six degrees south of Mars, so nowhere near as close as the moon and Saturn are going to come, but it will be quite easy to find Mars because you'll just go directly up from the moon. And this one's going to be visible probably for most of the southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere as well. So the next one that's happening is on the morning of Monday the 18th of February, and this is between Venus and Saturn. So if you've never been able to find Saturn before, because it is a lot fainter than the other planets, this is your chance, because Venus is so freaking bright in the early morning sky that it's really easy to find, and then you're just going to go below Venus about a degree, which is sort of about two thumb distances, until you find Saturn. Now Saturn will be a lot fainter than Venus, but if you get binoculars on it, see what you can see, see if you can see those sort of rings around it which will appear as almost like Saturn's got ears through binoculars. All right, so we're done with the night sky now. Let's chat about what's been happening in space news this past month. So the big news this month was the New Horizons flyby of a Kuiper Belt object called Ultima Tool, and I think that's how you pronounce it, and it's just what I'm going with so far. <laughs> so some of you will remember New Horizons from the flyby it did of Pluto a couple years back, uh, and be wondering, well, how come it's doing another flyby again? And apparently this flyby was planned uh, in the mission originally. So they always knew that once they got past Pluto, they would be getting into the Kuiper Belt, and therefore that they could have the opportunity to fly by an object in this belt and do the furthest planetary flyby in history as well. So really, really exciting. So on New Year's Day at around about 5.30 in the morning UK time, New Horizons came within 2,200 miles of Ultima Thule. And it was going at about 32,000 miles an hour. So they really had to hunt the whole trajectory of the New Horizons spacecraft for any debris, because you know anything hitting the spacecraft 
at that speed could take out the instruments needed to conduct the data. It could even take out tools it needs to send the information back to Earth. So it was really important that they didn't find anything. And thankfully, they didn't. So it could do the flyby successfully. Uh, of course, they didn't know at the time whether it had done the flyby successfully. So it was pretty uh, nervous, um, I've heard, at Mission Control uh, in Maryland. One of the images that it had sent back like well before the flyby on New Year's Day kind of showed it looking like it could be a binary system. So two objects actually going around a common center of mass. But then when they got closer and got a much more detailed image, found that actually those two objects were touching each other. And so the reason that they wanted to explore the Kuiper Belt was for this reason. They wanted to understand how planets form in the early solar system. So the Kuiper Belt is very well preserved. It's very far away from the sun's influence. And so it's kind of a fossil of the early solar system. And so people studying planet formation and planetesimal formation were really interested in this flyback and the fact that it found that it was a contact binary. So the fact that it was a, they were touching these clearly two sort of spherical objects suggested that they had to have come together very, very slowly. Because if they come together really fast, you know, the two things would have just sort of, you know, blown each other to smithereens. But in fact, they sort of touched and remained uh, together in this one system. And that's how people thought that planets have formed in the early solar system as well, that these individual lumps of rock have slowly come together under gravity, clumped together and built up larger and larger bodies over time. So the solar system modelers were very, very happy. Um, but also, you can see that they're spherical, obviously, but they're also lumpy. And so the lumpiness suggests that even though they have come together under gravity, gravity isn't dominant over the object. So if it was a pure sphere, like we're used to seeing with planets in the solar system, it would mean that gravity would be equal at every point in the surface. That's why planets are spherical. But the fact that these are lumpy suggests that it's not big enough in order for gravity to have become dominant in that system yet. And there's a couple of other things that we've already managed to figure out from this image. So one of the things that people look at is the color of the image, and that can tell you what the composition of the object is as well. So you'll see that on the neck of what is essentially the snowman of Ultima Thule, um, it's a lot brighter than the rest of the object. And so people were puzzling over why that could be. Some have suggested that it's where all of the loose particles on the object have sort of rolled into that neck, because that's sort of where things would end up if they could roll on the surface. They also managed to get a colour image of Ultima Thule as well, and that showed that it was actually kind of reddish in colour. Now that was expected because a Hubble Space Telescope observation of just the pinprick of light that it appears from Earth it suggested that it might be reddish in colour, and that actually confirmed that. So it suggests that Ultima Thule was actually made of methane ice, because we know that when methane ice is exposed to cosmic rays, it turns red. So this isn't all we're going to get though from this flyby. There will be data sent back to Earth uh, from New Horizons over the next 20 months. That's how much data it still has left to transfer. So I'm really excited to see what other results come out of this flyby and how much more we can learn about the early solar system and how the planets have been formed. So the other big news this month, which was exciting, was that China have landed a probe on the far side of the moon. Now notice I said far side. I did not say dark side. The dark side of the moon moves. We're talking about the far side of the moon that we never see from Earth because the moon takes the same time to rotate as it does to go around the Earth. So it was launched uh, back mid-December and it landed on the 3rd of January, a robotic landing, uh, right in the South Pole Aitken Basin of the Moon. And so the idea is that this is going to explore a really famous crater on the Moon called the Van Karman Crater, which is 2,500 kilometers in diameter and 13 kilometers deep. It's one of the largest and deepest craters known in the solar system, and it was thought to have been formed by a giant impact uh, from an asteroid, so uh, energetic that it thinks it's actually punched through the crust of the moon down to the mantle. And so that impact will have thrown up rock from the mantle, the interior of the moon, and they're hoping that Chang'e 4 will be able to actually get samples of that rock from the mantle and be able to determine what its composition is and if it's different from the crust of the moon. And that'll uh, help us uh, put more evidence towards the main theory that we have for how the moon formed, which was a giant impact of another planet in the early solar system with the Earth, which completely liquefied the Earth and the other planet 
that hit into the Earth, and then all of the debris that was then around the Earth was clumped together under gravity to form the Moon. But the really big news is that they managed to grow a plant on the Moon. So they sent up essentially a biosphere. So they had seeds of cotton, rapeseed, I think they had some yeast in there, they had a flowering plant. And then on January 15th, they released this picture that this cotton seed had actually managed to sprout and grow on the moon, which is incredible. It was such amazing news and such a really cool thing to see that it happened. But unfortunately, the very next day, they announced that it had died. And the reason that it died is because, you know, you can provide a plant with a biosphere with, you know, the right nutrients and humidity and water, but at the end of the day, the temperature on the moon is fluctuates so much and it ends up dropping to like minus 50 centigrade during the lunar night. And so the poor seed just froze and didn't make it through the night. So this is the first time that any biological matter has been grown on the moon. So it's a really big deal because the eventual step in space travel is to use the moon as basically a base or a sort of space station that you can launch other missions from, say missions to Mars. It would mean that astronauts wouldn't have to come back to Earth to restock, refuel. They could do all that from the moon itself. And so this is sort of one step towards that. But there's a lot of other experiments that this uh, Changi 4 is supposed to be doing. It's also got a radio spectrometer on board, testing whether you can do radio astronomy from the far side of the moon, because it's very, very shielded from radio signals from Earth there. So it should be an excellent place to do that from. So that'll be an interesting experiment to see what they find from that. Also, the plan is for China to launch another mission in the next year or so called Chang'e 5, and that plan is to actually return some of the samples from the moon back to Earth as well. So that'll be really exciting if we can do that, especially if those samples are going to come from the moon's mantle and its interior as well. Okay, so we've heard about Ultima Thule from the solar system, we've heard about the moon in the solar system, so let's stick in the solar system for now and talk about this really cool result about Saturn's rings from the Cassini mission. There's been a really long running debate about Saturn's rings and how they were actually formed, because if they were formed when Saturn formed in the early solar system and when the actual planet itself formed, then why don't a lot of the other planets have rings as well, like if it's a common thing? Or maybe it's that it's a quite a young occurrence, perhaps like a comet or an asteroid or another moon of Saturn has been torn apart by gravitational forces around Saturn. Now, if you remember, Cassini sort of did a death dive into Saturn's atmosphere at the end of 2017, after a good number of years sort of exploring Saturn and Saturn's moons, and sending back some amazing images and data, and we got some really, really interesting results from it. One of the last things Cassini did was it did 22 orbits between the rings of Saturn and Saturn itself, and it came incredibly, incredibly close to Saturn as it did that. And so what it was able to do was actually very carefully measure the gravitational field around Saturn, and by doing that it could get an estimate of the mass of the rings of Saturn. Now previously, another result in Cassini had showed the rate at which the rings were accreting like dust particles and sort of grains of rock, because really they should be pure ice, and slowly they've been building up more and more dusty. So you know, they would have been a lot brighter in the past. So along with this measurement of the rate that the dust was being accreted, and also they knew the proportion of ice to dust in the rings as well, once they got the total mass of the ring, from the rate that the mass was increasing, they could get some estimate on the age of Saturn's rings. So they were able to get the mass of the rings from these really close orbits. They found that it was about 15.4 times 10 to the 15 tons, uh, which is about two-fifths of Saturn's moon Mimas, which if you've never come across Mimas before, Oh my gosh, it's going to be your new favourite moon in the solar system because it looks like the Death Star from Star Wars. So from this measurement of the mass of Saturn's rings, they've actually put an estimate on it being no younger than 10 million years and no older than 100 million years. Like, that might sound like a lot, but in solar system history terms, that's like last week. It's like yesterday. Like, there were dinosaurs roaming planet Earth a hundred million years ago. So that suggests that, no, okay, these rings didn't form, you know, when Saturn formed. Perhaps they are some remnant of some icy comet that was torn apart as it got cl too close to Saturn. 
So some of you might remember that I did a video in my Unsolved Mysteries in Physics series a couple months back on fast radio bursts and the fact that we have no idea what they are and there's only a certain few that we've actually detected. Well, they detected another one recently and it wasn't just a, a random detection, this was another repeat fast radio burst. So there have been some fast radio bursts which are these sort of short pulses of, of radio emission that we've detected which have been sort of isolated events. But there was one back in 2012 that was detected that was repeat emission from the same source of one of these fast radio bursts. And the announcement that came at the American Astronomical Society that happened in Seattle in the first week of January, uh, they were announcing that a Canadian experiment, CHIME, back in the pre-commissioning phase last summer, like July and August, had found about 13 new detections of fast radio bursts, one of which was a repeat detection from the same source again. So this is really important because before that one source that was a repeat fast radio burst was sort of an anomaly, it was weird. Whereas now we have a second source that is this repeat fast radio burst. And the more we know of these things, the better because we're actually gonna have a better chance of figuring out what the hell they are <laughs> if we've got more of them and have observations of more of them. Because our best hypotheses at the minute range from a spinning neutron star in a really high magnetic field to, you know, emerging neutron stars or, you know, some people even go there and go for aliens. So speaking of the American Astronomical Society meeting that was in Seattle back in January, there were a large number of astronomers that actually couldn't go to that meeting because they were paid by NASA, which is a government-funded organization, and the US government, uh, at time of recording, has been in shutdown for nearly a month now. And so they have been unpaid since then and weren't able to go, and there was a lot of results and a lot of presentations that didn't happen because of that shutdown. At the same time as well, there was an issue with the Hubble Space Telescope and that couldn't be fixed because of the government shutdown. It turned out to just be a software problem, not a hardware problem, thankfully. But you know, this government shutdown is also now starting to affect science, which isn't great. So the other thing I want to talk about, which is not strictly space or astronomy news, but is connected, uh, is the fact that CERN is planning on building a new particle accelerator. Now they have the LHC currently, which is this circular tunnel under Geneva that they've built, which is 27 kilometers in circumference. And they're planning this even larger tunnel that they're gonna to have to build, which will be 100 kilometers in circumference. And the reason that they are planning on building this so that it'll be so much bigger is because they can reach higher energies and higher speeds with the particles that they will collide together uh, underground in this tunnel. And the reason that they want to do this is because their standard model of particle physics is still incomplete. And that is because astronomers keep finding observational evidence for dark matter. Everywhere we look we'll find more evidence, whether it's in the rotation curves of galaxies, whether it's from um, gravitational lensing around clusters of galaxies, whether it's from the collision of two clusters of galaxies as well we keep finding more and more evidence for it. And so they need to understand what dark matter is actually made of. And the hope is that reaching higher energies, they may be able to probe this particle and figure out what on earth it could be. So that's it from me this month. As always, if you do get any images of the night sky this month, whether it's the conjunctions that I talked about earlier in the video, or whether it's just of uh, the beautiful night sky wherever you live, send them my way because I always love to see them, either on Twitter or down in the comments below, and I will see you next week. Hello everyone. Hello. I can't say hello anymore. Bye bye of Ultima Thule. Thule? Thule? Tool? Thule, Tool. Uh huh. Of Ultima Thule. And was going at about 30 do. 30 do? 30 do. Oh, internet, why are you not being helpful? Why does the network change? Just connect to the Wi-Fi. You know, why don't we connect to my iPhone hotspot? There you go. I'm done. I'm done. I'm hungry. Can we have tea now? Yeah.